to the Data Science Workshop by AppCode Academy. For First of all, before every, anything happens, uh, with those of you that brought a computer and that want to go through the, through the presentation with me, you can go to the data science uh, dot .com, and you will see something like this. So data science. Yeah, so this is this is um, this is called Binder. It's uh, it, it will set up a virtual machine for you, and it will set up uh, an environment with the with with the same tool that I'm using. So you will be able to follow the presentation, and you'll be able to run the code that I'm, that I'm going to show you. So it's actually a very cool tool. It is if you if you if you see here, if you click on the show part. Uh, you can see that it's actually launching the server. So in a bit, it will actually set up the whole thing, and it will look like my. It will look like something like this. Wait, not this. Uh, it should look like this. This is like the the environment that we're going to use. And uh, if you click here, you you will get the the presentation there. This, the, this presentation is interactive, so it also has code, and, and you can actually run it. So that's why we're using the, the binder option. I think, yeah, this one already launched. So once you get hit with this, you can, actually, you can actually click here. Sometimes, it, it, because it's on beta, and it's, like it's, it's not like final, a final version, so these guys, uh, sometimes it, it doesn't work properly. So you might have to like reload it and stuff like that. But please be patient because this is like uh, really new stuff that they're doing. And they're actually providing it for free. So uh, just make sure like, um, it is uh, not very stable. OK? So I'll go to my presentation. And I'll start presenting myself. Uh, my name is Marco, and I'm the head of AI and chief data scientist at Upcode Academy. So I came to Singapore to finish my PhD in robotics, just right across the street with the, with the guys from ASTAR. Uh, and after that, I stayed around, and now I'm working at, at, at full time at Upcode Academy uh, in charge of the data science track. So any any questions that you have with the courses or anything, I'm here to help. Um, so enough on my side. You can, if you want, you can go on the website, check my, my whole thing. It's on the Upcode Academy website. So I want to get like an idea of what you guys, what is your background? So I can actually go faster, go slower, explain different things. So first of all, who knows any programming language here? Raise your hand. OK. Quite a few. Who knows Python? Python, good. Who knows Jupyter Notebook? Anyone? All right, that's a few. And who hasn't done any coding ever? Can raise your hand? It's fine, no, no, no worries. We won't, uh, it's actually so I can explain what is these things, right? So, okay. Um, so this this that I'm using is is a Jupyter a Jupyter notebook. Uh, for those of you that never never saw it, it's actually so it looks like a presentation because I'm using an extension called Rice, but it's actually a Jupyter notebook. It, you can actually exit and and you can see the whole the whole thing. It's got the slides there and it's got uh, so it's actually markup language every every single cell and they they become slides. So you can actually play around if you go into the into the website. There's, there's also some other options if you want. So if you go to, in my GitHub, GitHub. So the source, I have the source code, it's, it's online. So you can actually go, should be under, what is it? Okay, yeah, this one. So you go to the, I'll put it here. So it is 
github.com slash Marco AG slash uh, what is it? Hacking online identity. Hacking online dating. So if you go there, you have the, the whole, um, the readme is not very updated, but it's, it's actually pretty much the same. So you have the first, the first version that you have to run the code is, is, is this one. So this is the easy one because it sets everything up for you. But as I said, it's not very stable. And because of size reasons of the data sets, you it's fine. You can still get the code at home and then run it. And, and, and it should be fine. Uh, but you'll be able to, do, to, to go through the whole, the whole, the whole uh, presentation, pretty much. Then you have the second option, which is the, the, op the, the advanced option. For those of you that already have Jupyter Notebook, you can actually get the code uh, using Git, and you can run it on your own computer. This is the most advanced version, but it, it will get you uh, more flexibility, right? And because these, some of these algorithms might take some time, if you run it on your computer, it will be faster. It will be definitely faster. And the third version, which is the not recommended one, because it's only read only, you won't be able to execute the code, but you will still be able to, to follow the, the, um, the presentation. So if you click here, you actually get a uh, non-interactive version of the, of the Jupyter Notebook. It doesn't look as nice as the rest of the presentation, but you will be able to follow through and you'll get the code inside. Still, you just not, you won't be able to execute, okay? So, yeah, let's go back to the presentation. So everyone should be uh, either running, trying to run this, uh, the binder, and once you run it, just click on the, on the notebook, which is the one with the, with the logo that, that has like a little book, right? So see, now it seems to be working. Yeah, there you go. So here you should be able to run the code and everything. It takes, it takes a while because it's slow. And as I said, Binder will launch the presentation. You can get out of the presentation mode by clicking on the, on the X. And then you can go back by clicking on the, on the rise extension up here, right? You can go back and forth. And we'll actually do that through the presentation. Because sometimes it's, the, it's easier to see code this way than in the presentation mode. Actually, this rise uh, extension is also very new. And it's not very stable either. So writing code in presentation mode is actually weird. Uh, at least for me, the, the the, it doesn't feel proper uh, and the, the cursor goes around and it's, it's not very, very stable. So we'll do it, we'll do it here, right? So for those of you that don't know what uh, a Jupyter Notebook is, it's basically a tool that we use. It's, it's embedded on your browser and we usually use it locally, not like this, uh, not, not online, but use, you, you, we usually use it locally. But, um, it helps us uh, teach, uh, especially Python. It, you can use other languages, but it's, it's mostly uh, famous for Python. So it is good because we can, we can put images, we can put text, and we can put code. So you'll see that we have code at some point, right? So to execute code here, you only have to hit run. So there's a run button here. There's, uh, there's also shortcuts. You can, you can hit shit enter, and then you can execute the code and that should work, right? So for example, in this cell, this is a cell. So every, uh, every now and then you'll find cells in the notebook uh, that, I, that I put there. You won't have to write code yourself because there's people that doesn't know how to code. So the code is already there for you. But if you know how to code, you can actually change the code and make different things that what I'm doing there. So it's actually also interactive for the people that knows how to code. So for example, if I, if I want to print something, I can just say print hello, and then I get a hello. So this is, this is already Python code being executed. 
And you probably you should be able to do it in your own uh, in your own version that you got through that URL, right? And another thing is that to create a new cell, you just click here on the plus, just here, and then you create a new cell, right? So I think uh, that's pretty much it. With that said, um, anyone has any questions about this, about the Jupyter Notebook? If you have any questions at any point, feel free to raise your hand, because it's better to answer whatever questions. Uh, I might skip something at some point, so it's easier to, to solve it as soon as possible, so you don't get stuck, because we all build all the especially in programming, all, all this knowledge builds up on, on previous knowledge, right? So as, if, if you don't get the starting part, then you might lose uh, some other parts at the end, right? So Jupyter Notebook with a rice extension. So I'm going to go and do presentation mode for a while, I think. Wait, it's not this one. This one, right? So data science. What is data science, right? Um, let's have a look at it. Wait, data science. So the way this presentation works is that it's got like main points on the, if you click on the, on the site, and then going down it's, it's, are those points. So you can see the four arrows here on the, on the bottom, so you can move around. If you press the space bar, it should, uh, should move around properly. So data science is uh, an interdisciplinary field uh, that uses scienti scientific methods, process, and algorithms to extract knowledge and insight from data in various forms. So we have a bunch of data, and what we use is like different, different tools that we have, uh, mainly our statistics, uh, data analysis, and machine learning, lately a lot of deep learning. And basically we try to use those methods to answer some question or give a solution to some problem. That is the, the basic the basic idea of data science. And for that, we use data. So then, as an output, we usually say that we, we get like data-driven uh, solutions, right? So you, you have a problem, you find a solution based on your data. So, wait, I gotta go down. So, data is the key. That is like, that is, uh, that is something that is it's widely spread so people usually tend to think that uh, that is how it is. Data is the key, and it is very important if, if your data is very big. So apparently size matters, and the speed that you process your data, and then a bunch of, uh, a bunch of buzzwords that go around uh, that describes how data um, is not, your data is so big that it's not able to fit in Excel, so you, you, you use some other methods, and you use like deep neural networks, and you use all these passwords, right? And then you use Hadoop, you use AC2, uh, Google Cloud, uh, PIG, a bunch of other tools, right? Then people go around fighting, like I, I use Python because it's better, I use R because it's better, or whatever, right? So that is like an old way of thinking about uh, data science. Uh, the truth is, I keep on going to this slide, the truth is that science is the key of data science. So the main point of data science and why data science is useful is because it's able to answer a question. So it is very important that science, it's a part of that equation. It is very important that you focus on, on what you want to achieve. You study the field that you, you're trying to, to where, where you're trying to work, and then work with the data in that field. So it's, it's a big on the, on the science part. You have a question, you have data, and then you have to release an answer, right? So it's, it's very important to understand those correlations that you will have in your data as a solution, and you have to understand if those correlations really matter. So it's actually, there's a lot of, on the research part of the data scientist, that is not only running algorithms. So you have to actually understand what is the, the problem and how the problem relates to your data, right? So why data science? So data, data science is actually, it's, it's very famous nowadays. It's like a, it's this, this buzzword that everyone uh, saying around and it's, it's supposed to 
to be very useful, right? So there's actually some examples that I want to share with you. So data science helps you answer questions with data, right? So we know already that. And this is an example. Has anyone seen this movie, Moneyball? Anyone? So this is actually a good example of how data science can help you out. So this is a movie in which they basically try to uh, build a baseball team using uh, data. So the, the problem that they have is that they don't have enough money to get, uh, the, or they don't have all the money they want to get the correct players. So they actually use data and statistics on those players to actually build the, the team. So it's actually a good movie if you want to check it out because it's very related to this field. And it's, it's actually based on a, on a real, real story. So it showcase, showcases the, the, the possibilities of data science, right? So another, wait, keep on going that way. Another is the Obama campaign. The Obama campaign was really data driven. It was, it was actually so data driven that they actually say that he won because of that. So it's the data, data science team of the Obama campaign, it's, it's actually very famous. And one of the key things that they did on the second, uh, second time he ran for president is that we actually discovered that the guys, so they tried to get the guys who wanted to vote for Obama, they wanted to get them to come to the polls, and they actually discovered that the populations that they were, were going, going to go to vote were not the ones that they expected. They were not the, the moderate people that it was supposed to be the guys targeting uh, voting for Obama. So there's actually something, sometimes you get like actually um, cool uh, out, outputs that you don't expect from, from the data. So this is another example where you, you will get like something that is not on your hypothesis. Because sometimes you, 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 you usually get an hypothesis, then you go through the data and then you confirm your hypothesis or not, right? So that's how it is. Um, another example is the Netflix price. So Netflix ran the price uh, for one million dollars, and it was mostly to to do like um, to recommendations of movies, right? Giving a movie like what are the other movies that you can watch. So these guys won the prize, and they got the be the best results. But what one thing that was not taken into account in the contest was the engineering part. So that is something that sometimes, depending on our problem, we have to take into account. Engineering part, because these guys, they, they did a merge of a lot of um, machine learning algorithms, so they got the best result. But the algorithm was so heavy that it couldn't run on Netflix servers. So they, their solution never got implemented in real life. So they won the prize, but Netflix couldn't implement the actual solution. So that is um, also uh, an example of how you have to actually think about your problem. It's not only the algorithm, even if you get the, uh, the best result that you can get, right? So yeah, data science is actually one of the sexiest jobs of the 21st century. So that's another reason, right? Why to learn data science? Because it's really uh, well paid and it, there's a lot of demand for it. So actually, uh, I looked at some data, and according to Forbes, it's one of the most demanded jobs in 2018, and IBM predicts uh, it will raise by 20, 28% by 2020. And then according to Glassdoor, it's the best job in the US. I think they only have statistics for this for the US and UK, so I got the one from the US. Uh, it's got like a really good grade, 4.8 out of 5, 4.2 out of 5 job satisfaction, a really good median salary, and a lot of job openings. They have a lot of job openings in the, in the website. So this is another reason why you might want to learn data science, right? So how do we do this? How do we learn data science, right? So we, we want to learn data science. and. There's the first rule of presentations, which is don't demo because always, it was always go wrong. But uh, here at, at, at Upcode Academy, we, we like to break this rule. So I'm gonna go through some code and I'm gonna do some demos here. So 
for a data saving projects, you usually have a problem or a question, which is the, the problem that I'm going to present here. And then you start gathering data for that problem in that domain, the data that you think that will answer your question, right? Or has the answer to your question. Um, you gather that data in different forms. We'll see what are the forms that we can gather that data. You prepare that data. You have to go through your data. You have to check out, like, if you have outliers or you have, like, different kinds of data, you have to put it in the correct form um, and all that. And then once you have that, you create a model. You create a model using either statistics, machine learning, deep learning, any of those techniques. That, that is not, like, the main point. The main point is creating a model that will allow you to obtain a solution and finally uh, get a uh, data-driven decision at some point, right? Which is what you actually want out of data science. You want to have the data as a backup for your decision, right? So the problem. So the problem in, that I'm going to present here is that I'm a lonely guy. Uh, I spend too much time with computers. I'm alone at home. I live with my parents, and I don't have a girlfriend. So what happens there? I went to OpenCupid. I decide because I don't go, I, am, I don't usually go out. So I go to this website and I join the website and I try to start dating girls. Right? I try to check. I fill it my 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 details, put up my picture, and all that. And what happens is that I get pretty mediocre matches percentages, and I get uh, only. 24 girls interested, and none of them is, are answering me. So that's a problem for me. So the result is that I'm still alone. Still at home, still alone with my parents. So I really want a girlfriend. And I know I'm a data scientist, right? So maybe I can do something about it. So let's go ahead. I go, and I know Python already. So I think that's a good way to start. I know Python. I can do some data gathering. And I'm going to check what happens, right? So now it first comes the first step, right? I got the problem. Now I, got, I need the data. So where do I get the data? There's different sources for data. Data sources, you can go get it. You can just go and start asking. data from a sensor, or like, the, for example, for self-driving cars, we have the guys of autonomy right here. They're always driving around, getting data. That's a, that's a way of, to get data. You, get, you gather the data yourself. Or if you have a Wi-Fi, you might want to get the data from the Wi-Fi, different, different types of data that you want to use, right? Another source, very good source of data, this is really good, is the government. Government, are, uh, they have a lot of APIs. Uh, they release a lot of data sets. Uh, from from the, the actual government. So for example, Singapore has data.gov.sg, which is actually uh, a good source of data that you can use. And you can actually run a lot of, uh, get a lot of conclusions using that data. Uh, in the US, there's the Freedom of Information Act. So you're actually allowed to ask for data that is stored by the government. So you can actually file a, a claim, and they will have to uh, send you data. Actually, I just read a post this today about this guy that wanted to figure out uh, when it was uh, the best day to fly for the, his parents uh, in, around Thanksgiving. So what he did is that he filed one of this to the San Francisco airport, and he got the information from the Wi-Fi. So he could check how many people signs up for the Wi-Fi per day. So he could, act, he could actually check what is the most crowded days on the, on the airport. That is not real, so you could have like better solutions, but it's quite close to the reality, right? Not everybody signs up for the Wi-Fi, but you, if you have more Wi-Fi users, you definitely know there's more people in the, in the airport, right? So that is, what, that is the part where you have to think about like, if your data really matches the reality that you have for the, for the question. The data sets, it's another one. We're going to see that one today. Data sets is the most common one, the easiest. But sometimes data set might not match your, your domain. So usually there's a lot of data sets released online. It's good for, for testing out things, and it's good for, for trying out different, um, different and for learning. 
but might not actually match what you want to do, right? Uh, and, uh, and sometimes uh, you also scrap it from the internet. That means that you go on, uh, you create a Python script, and you basically go through different websites and get the data from it, right? And then you use that data. So you could go and scrap Wikipedia, and then use the, some data from Wikipedia, and then save it to a file, and then you can read that file and use that data to run your algorithms. That is also an option. So these are the main. This is already code. This is these are the main. Uh, for those of you that don't know Python, these are the tools uh, from Python that I'm going to use uh, on the first part. So the first part. Uh, I decided that I sign up for I sign up for this OKCupid, okay right? And I'm 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 actually selecting OKCupid okay because the founder is a mathematician, uh, one of the founders, and he is actually very data driven. If you go into the blog of OKCupid, okay you're gonna see like a lot of actually through the presentations. I think there's some links to the blog because he he was actually posting a lot of information about the data science uh, behind OKCupid. Okay so actually there, we will we'll see it um, in more detail, but one of the keys of OKCupid is their matching algorithm. So this matching algorithm, it's actually trying to put a mathematical algorithm to love. So it's actually trying to get two people and try to come up with a, with a percentage that says if those two people will like each other at some point, right? So we'll see how the algorithm works because it's actually public. There's actually a link uh, to, the, to the founder talking how the algorithm works. And then we'll try to do some hack around it. So first of all, we're using this, these tools. This beautiful soup is a tool that we actually, we actually teach it in, in, in data science introduction. It's actually a tool for web scrapping. So it's actually meant for going through websites uh, content and saving it to files. Requests is a, is a tool from Python that we use to get requests to, to create a HTML requests, same as the ones that our browser is doing. Uh, RE is for regular expressions. Uh, for those of you that don't know regular expressions, that is basically to match. Uh, we use them to match certain patterns of text, so we can actually extract parts of the text uh, at some point. JSON. For those of you that don't know uh, what a JSON is, basically a JSON is a structure of data. So JSON is, uh, we'll see, uh, probably I can show you how a JSON looks like, but it's basically a structure of data where you put like different fields and you can actually extract those fields. So the, the, these JSONs are used a lot to, to send information on the web. So most of the websites, they will use JSON and a lot of uh, servers and different applications, they will use that. And we use time. I think it's just to put uh, some waiting uh, to, to not, not to make too many requests to the website. So I think we can execute this. Yeah, we can execute this. Uh, uh, you can actually run uh, pressing here. I think you can execute that. Or you can shift enter. And you, nothing happens uh, because it's just loading the, the libraries. But you will see the number on the left changes. So if the number of the left, uh, on the left changes, it means that that was run. If there's an asterisk, it means it's still running. If, it, if that asterisk is there for a long time and you're not doing something that is very heavy, then there might be a problem. So you can actually go back, you can go here, and, um, and actually, if there's, a, if there's a problem with the asterisk, you can, you can actually come here and, and press that uh, restart thing. That is just in case. Uh, your your uh, notebook hangs, okay. So I'll go back to my data sources. Yeah, we were here, right? So I think actually I'm I'm gonna keep it here so we can actually see the code because now it's, it's mostly code. So what I did is, and you have to do it if you want it to work because I'm not gonna give you my password. You have to sign up for OkCupid. Okay so I went and I signed up for OKCupid, and I got a username and password. So you need that if you want to uh, keep going. So for this, I can, I have, probably on the code that you have, there's a default username and password that hopefully doesn't work. Because I got my, my own, right? So you have to create a new 
cell, and you have to write down your username equals. You write down you write down, write down your username there, and then you write down your password. Password. And this is because what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to gather data from OkCupid OK profiles. And to access to OkCupid OK profiles, I need my username and password. But don't worry if you don't if you don't want to sign up, it's fine because this is only for the gathering data part. You you'll be able to 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 execute code on the rest on the rest of the of the of the thing. So I have my uh, username and password loaded already. So I have I created a little function that will basically perform a logging on the website. Hmm? PS4. You're, you're missing a library? Uh, there's no module named PS4. Oh, oh you, might, you might need to have that module. Yeah. Uh, you, you might have to install it on the binder. You, you have it on binder, right? You're running on the, on the server. Yeah. So you might have to uh, add it to the, to the Conda. So it's, it's, it's a bit tricky. Yeah. So for this one, I created a login. And it's basically just uh, performing the, the login. It requests a session. It uses the URL from the, from the site, which is basically okcupid.com uh, slash login, login, right? So, and it, returned this, it returns the session. So if I run this code, now I'm, I, I'm logged in to okcupid. I have a session, and I can use that session to request other websites. So what I created here it's uh, basically a URL with the search that I want. So it's with a bunch of filters. And I think uh, if I remember well, it's like you know, uh, any gender is getting like, everywhere in the world. So like, uh, the filters that I, that I set up are on, those, on, that, uh, on that URL. So I can run this, and I get a page. So this is. For those of you that don't know, this is HTML. This is how a page looks like in, 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 in real. It's a, it's a plain text. So that's how a page uh, looks like when you browser get it. So that's, uh, that's what your browser will read, and then will show you how the nice, the nice looking page that you get. So if I go through this code, right? If you go, it's, it's quite big. So I think if I, if I go through this, at some point, you get, you see here, that it's saying ethnicity, drugs, smoking. So it's showing some, some useless information there. So if I check this, um, should be, no, it's not this one, because this one is generic, right? This is mine. So this is display name, this is Marco. That's my profile. I have to go down. You can actually ch search for uh, we can search for real name, right? Real name, this is mine. Yeah, so this is the information from the users. So I search for, for some of the fields, and then I, I realize that this is the information from the users. Uh, location, Berlin, status single, and all that, right? So if I look at it, uh, it actually doesn't come on the HTML. It comes on a, J, uh, on a, on a JavaScript. JavaScript are an, it's another uh, type of code, for those of you that don't know, that actually gets executed on your browser. So what happens is that this is getting executed on your browser, and then it's changing the website at when, you, when you have it, right? And it's loading the user information there. So for this, we have to do some little tricks to get that information out of there, right? So and that, the whole thing that is this, this structure where this data is coming from, it's in a JSON. It's a JSON file. Uh, it's a JSON uh, variable. So what I did is that I came down and I basically realized that it's uh, under this function. This is one of those uh, regular expressions that I told you about. That is a regular expression basically that uh, selects that, that chunk of the website. 
where the where the JSON is, right? So I run this code and I get a smaller version of my of my website. And then the next one is basically giving me a JSON. It's, give, it's actually extracting the JSON from that chunk of code. So it's basically just removing the rest of the stuff on the function and just uh, outputting the JSON file, right? So this is the, the JSON file, the JSON um, structure. So actually, for you to see, I'm going to just copy the whole thing. You can actually do it, even you, the, the ones that are not, you probably have it already there, right? So you can actually do it for whatever uh, information you got there. And I think there's, uh, there's a bunch of online, online uh, JSON viewer. So there's a bunch of online JSON viewers that will format this whole thing and make it look nicer for you. So you can actually paste the JSON file. What, not this. I can, not this. Where is it? JSON file. There, and then I can format this. And if I format this, I see the whole JSON file with the different fields, right? So I can see there's a parents here, and then I can see total matches one, and I can look for the users at some point. And this looks like pictures. And this is a username. So I have user ID, username, and I have gender, age, and all that. So I got some users information there already. Now, <coughs> I need to get that information out of there, right? So I can load the JSON into a JSON structure because up to now it was just plain text. So this is basically just loading the, the JSON. Wait, I got uh, extra. So I can just run this. And I can actually print the data. I can actually get, I think I got only one user. Because the, 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 if you go to the OkCupid website, I think I'm here, right? And if you paste the search that we were using, the number of users that you get is random. So if you copy this URL, and if you paste it on your OkCupid website, oh, I need to sign in. So it's data science. Uh, So if I sign in here, data. Right, data. Yeah, thank you. So here's. Yeah, all right, thank you. So if you come here and you post the uh, the URL, you can see that the amount, so this is how, this is what we're getting that doesn't look, so you can see I'm, I'm looking for all genders, everyone, any age, and all that, right? So it, this is actually very random. So every, every time you uh, reload, you get a different number of, of users. So you have, we have to take care of that. So here, we're accessing the, the data, and I want to access the first user. So this is the first user, Harlan, real name. So if I go and run this, this is a function that I created that will print the information. This is how you access uh, JSON, uh, JSON information. Yep. So you can actually, wait, this is, 
is uh, so this whole thing is uh, to access the information from the user. We can print it out and check if it's uh, if it's working. So I run the function and I can see that I got one user. So that's why I was trying to access the second user, but I only got one. And I'm not showing the real name and display name, but I, I'm showing the rest of the of the information. Last logging and all that, right? So this way I already know that I can scrape some data from the users. Then I can save that into my file, and then I can run this for like 60,000 users. Data science, some, some algorithms to, to decide uh, what to do, right? So then I created this loop that actually it's only scraping uh, 10 users because it, it's, it takes too long, but if you run it, it, it takes a while because you, you get users that are the same every time you... So what it's doing is basically just doing the whole thing that we've, we've done, but it's doing it uh, several times. So we're taking different users, and I'm just printing the user ID. It takes a long time because uh, you, if, you, if you check those user IDs, they, are very, uh, they, they come uh, all the time the same. So you have to wait for a while. So if we keep on running this for, for the whole day, or we leave it at night or something, then you might be able to get, I got 11 users there, right? So we got 11 users. So that's how you can gather data using web scrapping. Uh, the, the other option is the one that I, that I actually used to, 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 to get more data because this is taking forever and because it's not very ethically correct to pass you the data that I scraped from my profile from people from OkCupid. So I actually got a data set. So this data set has uh, 60,000 online profiles and it was published, published in, this, uh, in this journal of statistics education. And it's uh, explicitly allowed by the OKCupid okay co-founder. So uh, we're okay to share it, uh, and you're okay to get it and do some playing around with it. So it shouldn't be that, that bad. There's some links there that you can check, uh, links to the paper, it's actually, a very nice paper because they, what they do is that it's actually an introductory uh, paper to data science. They use R instead. We're using Python here. They use R, but uh, it, it, is, it is actually, they use this data set basically to, to introduce, introduce the, the data science to, to a class. So it's actually a good paper. There's some uh, article from Wired about ethical issues and all that. So you, I'll let you to, to check that out. So now, the data set, we can download the data set. For those of you that are using the, the binder thing, hopefully this part works, and you can actually execute this, and you'll get the zip file from the data set, which sits on GitHub, it's on a GitHub account. So you can actually get the, the data sets with all the profiles. So once we get the data set with all the profiles, we can actually go ahead and zip it. So this actually executes uh, the command unzip, and it will unzip the profile CSV on the, your binder. And you should see it here. So you should have a profile CSV file on your uh, directory of the binder machine, right? So congratulations, we got data. That's the first step on data science. We got the data. Now we're gonna play with it a little bit. So we got a few libraries there that we're gonna use. The first one, it's actually, I would say it's one of the most important there, but actually all of them are important. The first one is basically the one that we use to mess around with the data. So we use it to read data, to, to check it out, and to plot information. Uh, that is actually one of the ones that we also uh, show to our students 
in data science introduction. Uh, but, well, pretty much uh, most of them are used so because they're, they're very uh, important there. So matplotlib is to do plotting. Uh, Seaborn is also to, to, to uh, view data. And NumPy is basically, it's actually a basic library in Python that we use for, um, for uh, arrays to do mathematical computation with arrays. So once we load that, we can go ahead and I think my, you see the, the, um, my cells are on asterisk, right? So that means that my uh, notebook is somehow hanged. That happens sometimes. So what you have to do in this case, which is what I said before, you come here, you restart the kernel, and you're good to go. Uh, but you have to, you have to go and rerun some of the cells that you, you run before. So for us, uh, I don't have to because this is totally independent from the, from the previous part. So I'm going to just run the, the, the part with loads and not see that works now. So now I'm doing the imports so I can load the, the, the libraries. And now I'm going to load the data. And this takes a while. It takes a bit of time. Actually, because uh, it, take, it takes a, a little time, and, and if, if it's too big, and we'll see it at the end, because I'm going to use another bigger data set, uh, that might take too much time. So for this one, I can check uh, the, the last part. I can check the last part of the, because there's, uh, we said there's 60,000 users, right? Uh, they remove. I think they remove the name and they remove some user ID, some, some information for privacy purposes, but they left the rest. So you can see most of them are from the San Francisco area in this data set. And uh, we, can, we can see this data tail when we use, so when we use pandas, we, we load the data into the variable data and then we play around with that. So when we do data tail, we get the last part of our data. So we, let, we get the last few rows of our data. So if we run the data tail, you can see we got all this information. So you can see this guy is athletic. Uh, I don't know what is this. That's lit. diet. It gets, uh, it eats mostly anything. It drinks socially. It, it do drugs often. Working on college, university, blah, blah, blah. Right? So you can see we got data there. So now we, could, we can play around with it. So we can see what's the shape of the data. So uh, you can see that we got 31 uh, columns. And we got almost, as I said, almost 60,000 uh, users. So we got 39 attributes for all the almost 60,000 users. Uh, we can see the data size, which is basically all the fields that we have, all the amount of fields that we have. We can see the columns. That is uh, all the 31 um, fields that we, uh, we scrapped. So we have like age, body type, diet, drinks, drugs, blah, 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 all that, right? And we can access uh, different information by the field. So we can ask, uh, get the data age. I can actually do the mean of the age. So I can check that. Uh, the mean of the people in OkCupid is around 32.3 years old, around, in San Francisco. Take that into account. So we can't, uh, so we have to, as I said, it is very important that we know where our data stands. So this is not about the whole OkCupid community, and this is not about the world. So this is about OkCupid people from San Francisco and exactly from 2012. So we have to be very careful with the conclusions that we run out of this, right? So let's see what we have. So we have got 60% of males, 40% uh, of females on this uh, dating app. Usually there's usually more males in, in dating apps than, than females, right? And we can check different things like, for example, the off Springs, like how many people wants to have kids, uh, wants to have kids but might, uh, 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 might not want them, might want them, and uh, all the different options that they have. 
So for this, basically what I'm doing there is just getting the offsprings field. If you go up, right, there's different fields here. There's one called offsprings, and that is the field that it relates to the part where the user sets whether he wants to have uh, kids or not. So I'm just checking uh, that, and I'm, I'm summing up all the users that have the same value on that field. That is basically what the value counts is doing. So that is, uh, and I can do the same with the sexual orientation, but I can actually do it on a plot. So this is a plot of the sexual orientation of the population that I got on my data set. So I got most of the people is straight, there's a little bit of gays and a little bit of bisexual. And thinking about San Francisco, again, we might think that the gay population is slightly bigger than in the rest of the world, right? So that's how, that's an hypothesis that we can take into account uh, when working with this data. So we can get statistics about the age, right? So we can get, as I said, there's a, there's a mean about 30, 32%. It's, a, it's the, about, about 32 years old is, is the mean of the, of the age of the people there. And we, can, we get that 25% are around 26, 50% are around 30, 70% are around 37. And wait a minute, there's someone that has got 110 years old and he's in OkCupid, okay right? Might be, who, who knows, right? But um, actually, if you check, there's two users older than 80 in OkCupid. Okay so that's a bit fishy. I don't know how many people over 80 knows OkCupid okay and how many people over 80 uh, is into online dating. But it doesn't seem right. So this is part of the data preparation that we set, right? So we got the data, we're uh, working on the data, and uh, we figured out uh, somehow that uh, there's two fishy entries in your data. This is very important because you want to clean your data from uh, data, uh, some noise that might uh, drive you into conclusions that you don't want to go, right? So these guys, we're going to check on them, right? So we're going to prepare the data for the outliers. And we get now the guys who have uh, more than 80 years old. So apparently we have a 110 years old person from Delhi City, Oklahoma, uh, California, which pretty much hasn't filled anything. So if, it feels like it's not uh, very real, the, this profile. And the second guy, it's a guy on 109 years old. Uh, with a body type athletic. So these might be also not be very good. So, so we can assume that these guys are not actually real profiles, right? So it seems that, that, is, that is what I say, the part where, where you come in, the science comes in. That's where you have to take the decisions and say, okay, uh, what is going on? Uh, an athletic guy of 109, years old, this is, this is clearly not real. So what I do here is that I basically, I remove this guy. And there's a D here, which is data. And I'm gonna do data here. I'm still getting the error on line print. There's a print on length data. So there you go. So now I remove the, the guys and the, max, the uh, maximum age is now 69. I remove the outliers. Now we, we prepare our data so we can do some extra uh, analysis. I can check out the age distribution for males and the age distribution for females. So this is a nice way to look at the data that we had. So you can see the age distribution around 30, as we said, and for the females, it's slightly, uh, maybe slightly less. And you can see there's this, this actually less, less females than males. And we can get the mean and the median for the age on the males. 
and I'm going to keep going because otherwise we won't have uh, too much time. But I'm going to check. I'm going to check both in a, in, a, in the same um, plot. So you can see here, males and females all together, and you can actually see the percentage of males in each in, in each age group. So one. Uh, slightly uh, conclusion that we can have here is that uh, women's after 60 uh, are the majority in OkCupid. So you can see that it's there, there's more uh, women's in the, in the community. And this can be also due to the fact that if we look at the information, not only in this group and in the, um, Actually, if we look into the general population and we look into Wikipedia uh, information, you can see that there's actually slightly more females than males in that, in that uh, age, in that range. So actually, somehow, this gives us uh, an, inf uh, an idea that our OKCupid data might actually uh, match actual population of or like a slightly a, a slice of the part of the population on 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 San Francisco. So now we're going to look at how tall they are, and we're going to check this. Basically, this this uh, algorithm is just getting the height. Uh, you can see some access to the height of the males and height of the females, and then we plot that information and you execute that code and you get this, right? So we execute the code. You can, I'm missing one D that is somewhere on 21. So 21 is data. If I run this, I get both, right? So you can see males are taller than women's and, and this is the, we get the, the self-reported height in inches there. So you can see that the men's are obviously taller than women, but we're gonna check this data to actual real data from, from other sources. So what I did is that I got the information from the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, which actually has data uh, that uh, publishes charts about this, about the, pop the population in the US. It is not the same, but we can still get some idea. So this is the data set that we're using. So all the time for these data sets, for those of you that don't know, we're using CSV files. So CSV files are basically text files where the information is separated by commas. So you can actually open this file with any text editor and you will see all the, I don't recommend actually to open the, the, the bigger ones because it might hang your computer because there's a lot of entries. So, but you can actually uh, check it out. So now I'm gonna run this and it goes to the, it reads the CSV directly from the, from the URL and we can see a chart with, the, with the, how tall the people are. So this is uh, the, the different, uh, percentiles of the different uh, uh, height in, in the US. So we're getting that the, from, from the C, CDC. Now I'm gonna adjust this data into inches so we can fit our data. That is something very important that you have to do. So now I got the, the same data that we were looking at and we can actually check out uh, how tall the, the guys are in the US. So you get 64, 66, depending on the percentile, right? For males or for females. And now I'm gonna compare both percentiles with the, with the CDC data and the uses that I got. So you can actually see that there's, the, there's a slight gap between my, my users and the CDC users. So if you run this, there you go. So, wait, 
There's a slight gap between my users and the users uh, and the actual US population. So we can drive different con uh, conclusions here. We can think about the idea that um, people in San Francisco is taller than people in the rest of the US. That might be possible. Or we can think that people is actually reporting a slightly higher uh, hate than real, right? So maybe we cut some layers there. And, and another option that we, that we might uh, think of is that we have users that are likely uh, shorter people are likely to not report their, their hate because they might not want to say that in a dating application, right? But that's actually what we've done here. So what I'm checking here is that how many uh, users have the, the, their hate field is actually null, which means it's empty. And I'm summing them up. So we only have three users that didn't report how tall they are. So that we can uh, scratch that hypothesis. So if we do some research online, there's actually one post from, from the OkCupid okay founder that is called uh, The Biggest Lies in Online Dating. And you can actually check that they run this test and they do it with actually much more data because they actually have the, okay, the, the actual OkCupid okay database. And it's actually, uh, uh, they confirm that they actually have a tendency to, to, to write down a larger uh, height and exaggerate it a bit, right? So this is uh, an example of how we caught uh, people lying on our, on our website, right? Actually, uh, another, another use of data science that uh, I'm just remembering, I was talking to one of the, the Grab data scientists, and they have a lot of problems with people cheating with the GPS. So the drivers will cheat with the GPS. And what they do is that they will actually uh, uh, hack the GPS so they can actually report different locations and they could report different uh, pickups and drop-offs that never happen. It's hard for Grab to actually detect this and they use data science for that. So they actually try to, like the same way that we did with these guys, they're doing with the, with the, with the guys that are driving cars in Grab, right? So they can actually check if it's real or not. And same with Grab food. Apparently there's also fake uh, food deliveries going on that they have to detect. So more things that we can do. We can check, this is checking basically um, the body type. There's not much to say here, mostly that Guys use, likes to use the term a little extra more than women, and girls likes the term curvy much more than guys. So apparently there's no many guys that can, uh, that, that will put the curvy thing in their profile. Uh, more things. I can, actually I have to load this part. So I'm gonna load this because it takes forever. So this is another data set that I'm gonna use later. But it really, it's really slow and it takes forever. So I'm gonna just load it now so I can go back and keep on explaining this. So, yeah, there's two curvy and little extra. So that's, uh, that we had a look at the data, uh, we prepared the data and we could, like for example, we could run an algorithm on machine learning, which is something that we haven't used here. And I don't use because it, it will take a lot of time to train and it won't be feasible for a small workshop like this, but we teach it on the data science intro. But for example, like you could do uh, some algorithm that will tell you if some profile is a male or a female based on whatever they, they write down, right? So probably the algorithm will take into account different features. And one of those features that uh, might be very interesting to look at would be uh, this uh, body type, right? Because it's very, it looks like it's very, uh, discriminative between male and, fem and female. So, let's go over OkCupid. Okay, and so, 
This is actually, uh, it is based on those, this, this is this guy, uh, Chris McKinley, and this, these are two videos from, from, from this guy. I think uh, actually one of them is not, even, the second one is longer, it's like an hour. It's not a video, it's like a talk. But uh, the first one is actually very short, like three minutes, so you can watch it if you want. Uh, basically, this guy had access to a supercomputer in his um, lab uh, at university because he got a job at university or something like that. And basically, uh, this, this, guy, this guy was uh, very unsuccessful on dating, uh, pretty much like me. So he actually decided to run algorithms uh, using OkCupid data from his profile into this, this server. And he actually ran into some uh, uh, ideas on how to actually date, uh, uh, get more matches and be able to date, to date girls, right? So that is uh, how he explains how he did it. And we're gonna try to do something similar here and see what happens, right? So what I did is I went online doing some research about how this match algorithm because actually one of the things he says on the talk is that uh, this match percentage is very important, not only on the, uh, on the dating site, but also on, on, the, on, on the actual date. So when, you, when he goes into a date, if the girl uh, has seen a higher percentage, uh, he says it's more likely to be more open to him, right? So he actually tries, so was his point was trying to ma uh, maximize this percentage, this ma uh, match percentage. And because if you have a higher percentage, then OkCupid will try to match you two together. Because the, the, it's supposed to have, uh, you are supposed to have higher chances of succeeding in that relationship. So Christine Rather, the co-founder of uh, OkCupid, as I said, he's a very into data science. And this is a video, a TED educational video, that, where he explains how the matching algorithm works. So it's actually where I got uh, the idea. I'm gonna explain it a bit here. It's better if you, if you watch the video later on or at home, so you can get an idea if you're interested and, and you wanna try this for yourself. Uh, as I said, he was a math guy. He was major in math. So his main point was to try to, to hack the love uh, scene and come up with an algorithm that will actually check if two people are actually uh, going to fall in love or not, right? So the first thing that he realizes that he needs to actually perform this uh, matching thing was data. So he said, I need data from both parts. Uh, whoever is going to be in that couple, I need data from those both parts, right? So what did he do is that he asked a few questions. He started asking answers from people and then try to match those. But then he realized that sometimes like, you might uh, like horror movies and that's okay. But then you might have certain, a certain personality and if you have a partner with the same personality, that is actually not actually very good match, right? So what they actually uh, move the questions to is that you get your answers uh, for yourself you answer what do you like on the other person, and then you answer how important is that for you, right? So there's, uh, there's different levels of that. And the way this works, right? The way this works is that we're gonna have an example where I'm gonna have uh, this matching algorithm, which is basically, you, uh, we're gonna have questions in common, it, it, because uh, we only take into account the questions that both persons have answered, right? Otherwise, we don't, we don't look at them. So we look at the questions that both persons have answered. And the way they, they, they give points to these questions is that they give zero, zero if, you, if you decide that that question for you is irrelevant. They give one if you decide if it's a little important. And they give 10 if it's somewhat important. They give 50 if it's very important. And 250 if it's mandatory. So those, those numbers, they came up with, it, uh, with uh, along all the testing and all that. Actually, I don't know, I, don't, I didn't check how um, old is the video. So probably that uh, information is not even there anymore because I expect them to keep on changing the, the algorithm. So <laughs> if we go down, now 
And I'm going to check an example, right? So we have um, person A and person B. Person A, uh, person B uh, we want to check how much person B satisfies person A. Person A. So we have two, uh, uh, two questions. And for the first question, it is, uh, it is very important. And we got it right. Right means that they got the same answer. Getting the same answer or getting the answer that the other person wants, uh, we, got it, um, we got it right. Because it's very important, we get a 50, right? But on the second answer, it's only a little important. And we got that one wrong. So it's, only, it's still like we got 50 out of 51. So we got 50 points on the, on the first one because it's very important. And we got 50 out of 51 in the second one. So that means this, uh, we have a 90, uh, 98 uh, percentage of satis uh, satisfactory there. So we are, we're uh, at 98 uh, compatible with B with A. So we, don't, we run the same thing for the second one. And you look that uh, for A, it's a little important, and we got it wrong. A little important is only one point. So we lose one point there. And then we got a second question that is somewhat important, and we got it right. And that is 10 point. So we got 10 points out of 11. So we got a 91%. After this, we, we average both scores. Because we have one score in one direction, and we have another score in the other direction. So we ran a geometric mean, uh, running the n square root of uh, the both. Uh, the, we multiply both, and we run the uh, n square root, where n is the number of questions that we have. This is called the geometric mean. So we get uh, an idea of like uh, how, much, how much they they are compatible. So here we came up with a 90, 94% uh, for both. So the match, this matching will be a 95% a 95%. Um, they say they have some margin correction, which is probably like how they keep on improving the algorithm and they keep on adding some different um, uh, different tunes based on the data that they get, because they get more, much more access to data than, than, than we do, right? So they probably can know that like, people is talking, if they actually go to a date, if they don't go, they can actually uh, have that data. So for this part, I'm using a second data set, which is from this paper. Uh, you have the link there. The data is on uh, Mega. I didn't download it, and I, I didn't download it for you. I didn't provide any way of downloading. So you can go on Mega and download it yourself, because ethically, this data is not that uh, nice as the other one. It doesn't have the, the, the permission from the CEO, and it's actually scraping the, the questions uh, from a user account, right? The first one is actually where, uh, was scraping uh, public profiles. This is doing it through a user account, same as I did with my own uh, account. And I, and I save it for me, but I didn't publish online, right? So the link is still there. If you want to try it at home, uh, you will have to actually download the code, and you will have to uh, run through the, uh, through the notebook yourself, OK? You would have to put the, the data set there. And it comes, it, it's pretty straightforward. It comes in. Um, it comes in a CSV as the other data sets. Uh, the only difference is that in this case, it's got uh, 61,000 different users. And instead of the profiles, I think we also have the, the profile data there, but we're not going to care about that. What they have is that they have 2,541 questions uh, from the users. And they actually gather users that have answered at least 1,000 questions from all around the world. So we can gather some, some of this data uh, for ourselves. So my hypothesis is we don't have uh, this whole information, right? So if we go back here, we don't have my answer. We don't have uh, other people. Uh, we have other people's answers. We don't have these two ones. So we don't have uh, how much uh, you'd like someone else to answer, and you don't have how, how important. Uh, uh, so you don't have the, other, the answer for the other person and the importance. But my assumption is like, if you answer something, you usually want the other person to answer the same thing. It's, and I, I wouldn't say that it's always the case, but I, I pretty much expect that to be 
90% of the time. And that is the science research part that I put myself into this. Because the data set that I have, I have to do, uh, I can only work with the answers of the people, right? So what I'm gonna try to do is that I'm gonna try to match my answers with the answers of other people. And if, they, if it's not very important to them, that is not a problem for me, right? But if they, they, like, they like me to answer something different, then I, I won't get a good score there. But uh, I still get a, I, I, I expect it to be a good score for me in 90% of the answers. Because if you like horror movies, you like your uh, couple to, have, uh, to like horror movies usually, right? So that is a hypothesis that I'm putting on this. And then we'll see, uh, I can see it then on the results. So because this data is huge, uh, that's why I went before uh, starting to load it, because it takes a lot of time. It's one, I think it's around one gigabyte of data. Uh, it's plain text, so that's a lot of data. And actually when I was trying before, it was actually uh, pretty much hanging my computer at some point. So this is a warning here. So let's see if the data was loaded properly. Hopefully it was. Yeah, there was. Uh, I can, as I said before, I did the tail of the data, which shows the last lines. Now I'm doing the head, so I'm showing the 10 first lines, right? Uh, you can see this is part of the profile. So we get if it's a woman, a man, and all this. And then you can see that there's questions there uh, from two to whatever, uh, uh, big number there, right? They have an ID, each question has an ID. And then the answers are here. And you get a lot of uh, null answers, so we have to clean that when we, get, uh, when we work with it. So that's something that we have to take into account. So what can I do with this? Basically what I said, I wanna see what it's actually the, the main answer out there and I can, I'm, I'm going to load this all of CSV, which actually contains the questions, because they have two different files. One file only contains the answers, and then uh, the other one contains the, the information related to the questions. This one loads very fast because it's, it's smaller, it's way smaller. So if I check at, at the head of the questions, you can see uh, a lot of questions there, and you can see that uh, Regarding food or plans, what's more interesting to you? You can say sex, love, and nothing else. I think you get, uh, if you look at the top, um, in this data set, you get four different options. So I'm gonna work with this data, and this is the, the topic, uh, religion, different, different things, right? So I can actually gather one question. So I think this question is, what is it? Q26, have you ever owned sex toys? This is the question that I'm checking. So if I run my uh, code, I can see all the answers that are not uh, null. So what I'm doing with that drop NA is just removing the people that didn't answer that question. So I'm only looking at the, the actual uh, people that answered. So now that I got the people that answered, I can run and count, uh, sum up all the people with the same answer. That's what I'm doing there with the, with the value counts thing. Uh, you didn't see anything because I didn't print, just save it to a variable. But now I can actually uh, get the percentage of people that answer yes and the percentage of people that answer no. Right, so that's what I'm doing there. Basically here, it's just like getting the numbers that I uh, calculated here and just make it a percentage, uh, looking at, at, the, at the whole uh, amount of people that I have. Okay, so I can see what is the, um, well, I didn't save this for qubit 26. I save it to question answer, so this is Answer. 
right? So basically what I'm doing here is um, I'm just checking what is the maximum, uh, the, the max, uh, maximum selected uh, option. So that is what I probably want to put on my profile if I want to get more uh, matches from my hypothesis, right? Mm, then you can check. Uh, actually, I build this, this little you can change the question that you want to check. And this one, I uh, don't remember what it is, but you can run it. And then you get um, well, Q44. Or you can, we can run like uh, some religions are more correct than others. So I run this Q44. And I get like 80% uh, of the people uh, thinks uh, yes. And 20% uh, that does not think that. So I might want to answer that because they might want to have the same connection with me. Um, one thing, uh, several things to take into account here. So I decided this and I did this into uh, my profile. I changed the answers. I put these answers, some of these answers into my profile. And there's a few mistakes here that I want you to, to learn that also happens, right? So we got algorithms, as I said, and the main point is not on the algorithms. We got some conclusions that might look good, but there's also ways to improve it. So for example, I did, cho I, I did choose, and this, those are uh, decisions that I, that I made, right? So it's actually this, in the science part. So I choose to run this algorithm over all the data set. So I could have selected, if I like females, I could have selected females maybe, right? Because the answers might be different. So that is something that uh, I could have taken into account. Another thing that I could have taken into account is the location of the people in the, in the data set. Um, so there's, there's different parts that you can actually uh, take into account. And still, you get like a pretty good idea of, of what it, uh, what it might look like. So I went to my profile, I changed a bunch of uh, uh, answers looking at this. And you, you can see that it changed the percentage of matches. Uh, uh, it is, it's, a diff, it's a bit different. And you get like 445 uh, uh, different matches there and much more higher percentage. So the probability of me finding love now on this OkCupid website might be a little higher. And it was all basically thanks to data science. So you can see that it's actually something useful. So this is the whole demo. And I want to end up with something more useful that is not. Data science has a lot of um, um, applications. This is a funny one. This might be useful for you. This might not. But that's like. Um, for example, there's one very interesting that is the actually data science saves lives. And there's, uh, there's uh, facts that are proving this. For example, nowadays, there's actually um, projects running on intelligent staffing, which means that they're actually taking data and checking how, how much uh, staff you need in the different hospitals. So that actually reduces the cost of, of healthcare. And it's actually giving more access to healthcare to different people by reducing by using this data to improve, right? You can give a better service to the users, and you can actually uh, um, reduce the price of healthcare. Also, uh, they're working on real-time alerting because you can get data real time, and then you can process that data against a bunch of uh, other information, and you can actually alert doctors uh, about. Uh, uh, things that happen that can happen or things that actually might happen at some point, right? It's also being used uh, to prevent opioid abuse. Uh, it's actually gathering information it, uh, to see where are the, the higher risk uh, factors on, on uh, people to get uh, addicted to opioids. Uh, it's also fighting cancer. There's a lot of information on cancer being uh, gathered, and this information is also run uh, through data science with different statistics uh, algorithms with machine learning to try to detect 
what are the causes and what factors uh, might actually uh, lead to, to a certain cancer at some point. There's also been used in telemedicine. So you can actually have patients at home, gather data, compare this data to other data sets and see what are the status and what are the outcomes that might be for those, um, for those students. So this is actually, uh, it was a funny presentation, but it's also a very interesting field for very uh, numerous reasons. And I want to announce that we have uh, here at uh, Upcode Academy, we have a full data science courses track. And um, we run different, uh, different courses, uh, starting from uh, Python development for people that actually don't have any knowledge about programming at all. And then we have an introduction to, to data science. And we have data science one, which is uh, for people that has a little bit more background on probabilistics and they have been programming around and they, are, uh, they manage properly with different libraries on Python. So, so that, that will be the, the second data science. And we have some data visualization course on, with Tableau uh, that is also available for you. And we also have uh, government subsidies on the courses and we're currently starting data science introduction on the 15th of December. And it's a six week course uh, that runs from 1 to uh, 3.30 p.m. And we also have the Python development for those of you that don't know uh, how to program yet on the 7.30 to, to 10 in uh, two weeks. So it runs, uh, I think it's either, what is this one, Monday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or is it? Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Yeah, uh, at that level. So I think that's it for now. Uh, thank you very much for everybody. Uh, you can uh, reach me at my email, marco at upcodeacademy, if you have any, any questions. Uh, I'll be happy to answer those. 